welcome to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Stephen Nagy. Stephen is a distinguished fellow at Canada's Asia Pacific Foundation, a fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, an appointed China expert with Canada's China Research Partnership, and he is also a senior associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the International Christian University in Tokyo. He is also a returning guest to the podcast, and our previous discussion about regionalism and summit diplomacy will be linked below. And I do encourage listeners to go and take that in for themselves as context for this podcast. Because as I just mentioned, Stephen has an extraordinarily deep academic record. And he's produced decades of work on East Asia, regionalism, middle power diplomacy, amongst many other aspects. And yet today we're going to focus on what Stephen also does quite regularly, which is produce incredibly thought-provoking journalistic pieces on the current shape of affairs in East Asia and the changes we are seeing around us. And so from that, this is going to be a contemporary podcast. It's going to focus on the coronavirus, not the medical details of the virus itself, but the political implications, how China first behaved when they became aware of it in Wuhan, the political scene and response in places like South Korea and particularly Japan, but also important questions such as the declining role of America in East Asia under Donald Trump, China's increase in assertiveness, and recently its willingness to use economic coercion against Australia, which of course, as Stephen will mention in this podcast, has its own history. They've used this type of coercion before on countries like Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Canada. And we will dig into some of these issues, particularly the Canadian one, because we're going to talk about Huawei and Hong Kong and the role that China has in these type of international affairs and the risk that China poses to an international rules-based order. We're going to ask questions about the need for a corona investigation into the origins of the virus and contrast China's response with that of Japan during the Fukushima disaster in 2011, and why investigations of this kind shouldn't automatically be seen as impingements on sovereignty. Rather, they are opportunities. And just like that, so is a crisis like the one we are currently in with coronavirus. It is an opportunity for middle powers to realign themselves around the world, to grow and to stake a stronger claim as an alliance, and build a rules-based order where the behavior of large powers like China and America do not dominate the globe. I'm going to leave it here so I don't give too much more away. But as I mentioned, our previous podcast is going to be linked below, as are the permanent links to Stephen's academic research and journalistic articles. I can't encourage you enough to go and read them and to keep yourself regularly updated on Stephen's work. It is an invaluable source of information about the world and specifically the East Asia and Asia Pacific regions. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. And if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast directly at the PayPal or Patreon link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. All your help in this regard is greatly appreciated. On that, and to walk us through coronavirus in East Asia, and all the risks, opportunities, and policy implications coming from that, this is Stephen Nagy. <laughs> Stephen Nagy, welcome back to the Career Now podcast. Thanks, Jed, for having me. I'm a big fan of the program. So as you mentioned there, we uh, did do a, a podcast uh, previously, and that podcast was on uh, middle power issues and uh, the Asia-Pacific region and East Asia. And uh, that is going to be linked below, and I encourage people to go and listen to it, add some context here. But so interesting throughout the current moment with coronavirus and all the issues that have come from it is it's pulled a lot of your research into this really interesting current space. So let's speak about coronavirus today and what it's done for the region and for middle power issues and for international cooperation. And I might start with a question about Japan, which is where you're based. I think everyone has a fairly good understanding of how uh, the uh, coronavirus and government responses exist in their own country, their own region. But just give us a space on Japan. How has Japan been dealing with this? And what does the scene look like from your uh, side of the world? Well, I think that um, on retrospect, Japan has you know, pulled through and, and come into a position of probably uh, a, a good example of how to deal with um, the coronavirus. But exactly how it's been able to deal with the coronavirus effectively, I think there's still a lot of questions. Um, you know, Japan's coronavirus story started with the uh, Princess Cruise back in February with uh, a, a cruise ship coming in from Hong Kong with infected people. And we saw that ship being uh, quarantined um, in Yokohama Harbor. And I think that international press was very severe on Japan in terms of criticizing its response and thinking about uh, and discussing why it, it, it 
continue to quarantine this, this ship as opposed to bring them uh, into Japan for treatment. But I think on retrospect, we're looking at, we've seen similar challenges in Australia, the United States, uh, and other places that uh, these cruise ships were vehicles of, of to potentially bring in the virus into these countries. And um, Japan's, I won't say hardline approach, but um, really it's cautious approach to the Diamond Princess, I think set the kind of narrative going forward on, on Japan's um, response to the coronavirus. And I think that in the mass media, it's been generally portrayed as quite negative. Um, we've had um, some prominent um, scholars write op-eds in, in, in the Washington Post and others criticizing the Abe administration. But today we look at the number of deaths and we look at the number of infections. Japan seems to be uh, you know, better positioned um, compared to many, many countries globally. Uh, and one of the leaders within the region with, you know, under 600 deaths and, and the infection rates remain relatively low. And we're moving into a period right now where um, that social distancing is, is, is still intact, but the government is reopening up businesses and uh, people are becoming more active. And, and Japan's economy is, is coming back online. So on that, let's, uh, let's step into your articles here. So you produce an awful amount of, uh, of um, uh, journalism. It's such a high productivity. It makes me feel quite shamed when I wake up each morning and read your latest article here. So I'm going to link these below, but there's so much content that you've been uh, pumping out during this, this uh, uh, coronavirus. I'm not sure if you have extra time at home at the moment, but it's really interesting reading, and it's given us a wonderful look at the East Asia region. So I might start the podcast here with a, um, a question which came out when the, when the virus was first hitting. It was really just in China. It was really, oh, sorry, it was in China, but it was really just a Chinese crisis at the moment, despite a few cases around the world. And you wrote a hopeful note at the time, and you wrote something along the lines of, uh, yes, this is a challenge, this is a huge problem, but it is also an opportunity, an opportunity for international cooperation, alliances, and bridge building. So let's start there. Let's start with that, how this could have been a hopeful opportunity for the world and for China and for East Asia. Well, I think that um, the res initial response to the coronavirus in many countries has not been a, a, a positive one. And I think that a lot could have been done to prevent the, the initial spread. And, and, you know, we have the experience with SARS. We have the experience with MERS. Um, and just last year, we had the experience with the swine flu. And it seems that um, countries within the region uh, didn't, you know, take a learning opportunity from those experiences to stockpile medical equipment, to, to create those information uh, sharing mechanisms, to uh, develop, you know, shared techniques to monitor uh, uh, and identify, you know, the super spreaders as they're called in some circles. And I think that, you know, this was a real loss. And when I was looking at what was happening in Wuhan and, and China in general, and then of course in South Korea, um, I was thinking, why don't, why isn't there uh, some kind of Indo-Pacific, you know, emergency initiative uh, in which these kinds of initiatives could actually take place? So, you know, stockpile medical equipment throughout the region, um, create, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, plans of how to deal with these kinds of outbreaks, uh, you know, create platforms for uh, transparent uh, information sharing. So the article was really written to try and, and promote some kind of, you know, new institutionalism that could bring, you know, China, South Korea, Japan, and Southeast Asians together um, within the region based on a common concern, and that's trans transnational diseases. Um, what we saw is that this hasn't happened, of course, but I do think this is a real important area to go forward. And, and my prediction is that, you know, initiatives such as the Free and Open Indo-Pacific or the BRI, the Belt Road Initiative, or South Korea's, you know, um, South, um, uh, Northeast Asia plus Alpha, or, um, all of these initiatives are going to, in the future, inculcate some kind of, um, tr you know, health pillar within their initiatives because it's mm -hmm. going to be crucial for um, managing uh, ep pandemics or epidemics within the region going forward. But importantly, I think in the post COVID 19 era, that um, there's going to be so much need to. Um, you know, build and sustain, uh, to strengthen healthcare systems throughout the region so that the economies can get online, so uh, a, a semblance of normality can, can, can return, and that that regional integration process can, can return to some form of normality. And in that article, a very interesting theme comes up, which I think for many people is worth exploring. So people have this idea that 
um, I suppose it, it, in some ways it's a retroactive excuse. They say things like, um, uh, you just simply couldn't have seen this come and it's something on a scale that we haven't had before. So how could we possibly plan for this? But you're right. In some ways, this is exactly why we have multilateral, bilateral, these uh, uh, super, supernatural institutions. This is uh, planning for uh, black swan events in, in, in a way. So I might you know, open up that, that issue of uh, this is exactly why we have uh, such deep cooperation around the world for when the unexpected just uh, does hit that, yeah, we're not ready for it entirely, but we have the mechanisms to gear up suddenly and uh, find ourselves in a good position quickly. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, you know, but we've moved into a position where, you know, we have a, a very competitive, if not, you know, a, a rivalry between China and the United States, which is, I think, fracturing how institutions, uh, international institutions are working. And, uh, you know, we have some domestic political challenges, um, both in the United States and China as well, that is complicating the decision-making process. And I think if these two systems worked better, the initial outbreak probably would have, have not led to the global pandemic we're, we're facing today. Um, and today what we're seeing is the WHO being pulled apart by um, both the United States and China, um, you know, making uh, accusations about each other's influence and each other's, you know, um, uh, nefarious uh, 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 behavior in terms of destroying how this organization works. And this is absolutely, um, you know, I think uh, it's going to lead to a global crisis if, if international institutions such as the World Health Organization can't function in a transparent, accountable and rules based way. Um, so I think you're right. It highlights the need for international organizations. But I think that we need to drill down further and try to get a better understanding how, you know, the strategic rivalry between the United States and China is 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 really disrupting how international institutions really work. And it's creating challenges for uh, regional cooperation and global cooperation. So let's talk about leadership at this time. Uh, you've written about Donald Trump and Xi Jinping and Shinzo Abe through a number of your articles. And uh, you are critical in some ways and uh, positive in others about uh, different aspects of each character, more so some than others. And I wonder how you see the leadership of these people um, coming through. So looking back on it, um, you've, you, you say uh, a lot of this, a lot of the crisis, a lot of the failure here, at least from the American side, is a failure of leadership. And you say from the Chinese side, it's got to do with obfuscation of truth and prioritization of legitimacy and position of power. So I might get you to touch on those two, and then we can go into the Japan question again and open up Shinzo Abe and uh, how he's coped with it. Well, I think we should be very clear that the initial response by the Chinese was a disaster. Um, but once the decision was made to to deal with the um, with the COVID nineteen virus, the um, system there allowed them to really you know clamp down quickly on Wuhan and Hebei province, and I think in general get the uh, virus under control in China. We don't know about second and third wave yet, but they had the tools to you know ensure that the virus. Um, did have control domestically. It was that initial process that was a huge problem. And I think it's very much related to consolidation of authoritative, authoritarian rule under Xi Jinping since the uh, 19th Party Congress in October 2017, where you know, he removed term limits. And in part, it's also related to the anti-corruption campaign where people are afraid to make decisions because they're afraid of being labeled uh, you know, uh, 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 as, as corrupt. And this really created a challenge in terms of that initial management in the Chinese context. Um, in the United States, uh, it's a very different uh, process than, that we've seen uh, um, uh, evolve over the past few months. I think that we saw in January, there was clear signals from China, clear signals uh, from the region this, that this was a very severe uh, virus and that it had you know, the chance for uh, spreading globally. And I think that the, the leadership, um, in particular the White House, and I really would like to distinguish between, you know, I think the, you know, the State Department um, and the other parts of the bureaucracy in the United States as being different than the White House. But we saw the White House downplay the severity of, of the spread of this virus. We saw Donald Trump talking about how he liked the numbers of the, of the spread in the United States. And even today, he's, you know, advocating for um, treatments like uh, that, you know, at, Doctors continue to say that don't um, positively impact the spread of uh, coronavirus. Um, so what we've seen is one action of, you know, 
not making the decision at the correct time. And then the United States, you know, hubris, I think, at this, that the state level and really not having, um, you know, a concerted approach uh, and strong messaging. And, and I think that's really important, strong scientific based uh, messaging of how um, Americans should move forward. And um, it, it, it's shocking to watch the, the coverage in the United States and read the different um, coverage about how to manage the virus on the different spectrums of the of different uh, sides of the political spectrum, because it's like two countries are, are, are in one. So, uh, you know, the reasons for the spread in both countries is very different. Uh, and I think that in some ways, the Chinese have, have had a better response to the coronavirus uh, than the United States. But of the long term, we just don't know um, what's going to be the direction in terms of getting the economies back online, how this is going to affect political leadership and how it's going to affect the political systems. So before we jump into Shinzo Abe, you touched on a point which I thought was just too interesting to leave there. And that is the idea that, um, yeah, the response of China has been uh, since the crisis and since early mistakes has been quite uh, impressive in the sense that they could shut down a whole province. And we can talk about how Japan has failed, has not been able to do that legally. And a lot of democracies simply can't do that. But you're right. But you, you just said there that in some ways this is a, a crisis that's built into the fabric of Chinese society in the sense that people on the lower level don't want to act because they're scared that they're going to be um, charged as corrupt or they're going to be removed from their posts. And this, uh, the reason I bring this up is because it touches on an idea that there is an institutional weakness inside China, that you look, a lot of people look at China and think, well, I, I, I envy the strength and the authoritarianism of the country without recognizing that there is a deep weakness in the system itself that is always going to bring about crises like this. Sure, they can respond well after the fact, but on the ground, People are so scared to speak out, so scared to just do their jobs and to make big, bold decisions that they're almost, um, this is almost bit baked into the Chinese cake in a way. I, I don't want to say Chinese cake. I think, uh, I think we, <laughs> we, we always really need to make a distinction between um, the political China and, and, and ordinary Chinese people. But I think decisions within the political system and within um, any system that has to engage with the political system will really... Uh, you know, people's um, calculus is that they need to think about what are the ramifications of this decision uh, in terms of the political process, and and can uh, uh, can my decision be interpreted as some kind of political decision or some kind of decision that goes against the Xi Jinping? And what we saw is that I think at the initial onset of the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan is that the initial doctors were shut down by the local police. And you know they were forced to sign documents stating that they were not going to cause um, social problems uh, by spreading these kinds of rumors about, um, at that time, uh, the Wuhan virus. And I, I use the word Wuhan virus because when I was in China in January, um, I was there January 3rd and my Chinese friend said, there's a, there's a Wuhan virus, be careful, don't go down there. So Chinese themselves were using this word. And, and now of course, this has been politicized by the Trump administration. And used in 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 almost racist racist ways, but I think uh, the point here is that uh, the political system really uh, created the conditions for um, this outbreak to to take place, and one wonders how this may um, you know ebb and flow into other important um, uh, challenges that are, I think are in the region. So I'm thinking right now about the escalation and tensions between Taiwan and China, or what's happening with this recent adoption of a or proposal to a uh, change the national security law with Hong Kong, or even in conflicts in South China Sea, is the decision making in all these three areas going to be impacted the same way as we saw at the onset of the uh, Wuhan virus or the virus in Wuhan? And and these are concerns that we should all be looking at. Let's step into uh, China uh, to Japan again then, and Shinzo Abe in particular. Now, just before the, we started recording the podcast, we were chatting, and you told me something which was quite remarkable, at least to my ear. And I asked you if uh, if 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 Japan had a lockdown, because parts of Korea did have a lockdown, and a lot of many other countries have. And you said it, they can't do a lockdown in in uh, Japan. It's illegal. It's constitutionally illegal. So I might get you to touch on Shinzo Abe then and the government of Japan and how they have handled it. Not 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 the uh, specifics because I already asked that, but how they are being perceived and uh, and just how public uh, per perception of Abe is uh, is holding up or not holding up throughout this crisis. 
So let's start with why there was, there's no legal requirement for people to shut down. And, and it has to do with Japan's post-World War II constitution, was, which was meant to check the power of the leadership, to check the power of the constitution. And of course, this is a, this is a, a reaction to, to Imperial Japan and, and how Imperial Japan, uh, you know, of course, did, uh, invaded, invaded uh, Korea and, and China, but also did unspeakable, um, you know, uh, things to their own people. So the post-World War II Japan has been set up in a way where, you know, the, the prime minister and cabinet really don't have the power um, to make, uh, you know, strong uh, legal decisions to lock down people. So what we saw in the uh, beginning in uh, the end of February is the government made a recommendation for schools to be closed uh, and schools were closed. And it was a recommendation. It wasn't an order. And then what we saw later that month is the state made a recommendation for something called jishuku in Japanese. And jishuku, the translation is self-restraint. And they've made these strong requests for people to be self-restraints. And they, they made, they made a pleas to the community that they would like to decrease uh, the overall footprint of people in, in, in public transport and in, in the workplace to about 80%. And, um, you know, this was... Uh, a request. It wasn't an order. And what we saw is that um, the community uh, collectively um, seemed to take that recommendation and, and really they stopped going out. Um, they shifted their behavior. They started wearing masks everywhere. Um, businesses uh, decided to uh, collectively close down and some of them are still closed down uh, right now or they changed their hours of operation. So um, the pubs and things are open until seven o'clock at night. And um, they can serve their last drink at eight or seven and they have to close at eight. But these are all kind of uh, requests. Um, they're not legal requirements by the state. And I find this really, really interesting because the response is linked to um, Japan's uh, post-World War II constitution. And, and you know, really the, um, the fact that the prime minister and the leadership can't have uh, strong legal, legal requirements on its society. Um, so... I might get a swing back just to Xi Jinping for a moment then from that from that space, because yeah. uh, I, I have to assume that this is an opportunity in some ways for Abe. So uh, we touched on China, of course, and this a lot of this is, is going to keep coming back to China, just as this is such a central issue when it comes to middle powers yeah. at the minute. So I wonder how you see Xi Jinping as an individual here. As you mentioned, he has now removed the term limits and a lot of people quite rightly around the world are concerned about a, a growing authoritarian in a country that people thought for a long time was democratizing slowly over time and going in the other direction. So I wonder how you see his leadership here. So he, he touched on, on the mistakes he's made, but how, what do you think of his position inside China and the position of the Communist Party? Because really interestingly, at parts of, in, in your um, articles here, you write things like um, – uh, that the Great Firewall of China, this thing blocking information, it's 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 not it's not that sustainable anymore. The holes popping up all over it, and everyday Chinese citizens are talking to each other, and also that uh, the large majority of Chinese are fully aware that they're being silenced, and there may be a, a growing discontent with this kind of uh, suppression. So uh, I might need to walk into that before we open up some uh, broader issues. So I think that's a really really it's it's almost a paradox because I think that. You know, every single Chinese um, that I, I I know has been impacted by the coronavirus, and privately, so much criticism about the initial response. Um, but today, uh, you look at you know, I think there'll be almost a hundred thousand deaths in the United States. Uh, we saw, unfortunately, many deaths in Italy and Spain. Um, you know. China's looking pretty good compared to, you know, the, the global superpower and, and the Western powers, at least from the Chinese point of view. And I think when we look at um, domestic uh, propaganda and media and how they're portraying, you know, the global uh, fight against uh, the coronavirus, what we're seeing is very negative images coming out of the United States and European countries to highlight how their government model is not working. And, you know, very positive images of how um, Xi Jinping in particular, remember, it's Xi Jinping's leadership. He's the central pillar. He's the people's leader in the Chinese context, um, has handled this uh, crisis uh, well. And they've even been able to, um, you know, use the spirit of, of, of the initial doctors that have died in, in, in the virus outbreak uh, as a kind of martyr for um, 
mobilizing Chinese citizens and mobilizing support for Xi Jinping and the Communist Party. And it's always this process of contrasting the failures of others and the relative successes of the current leadership in China. And I think this is a paradox because, um, you know, for for ordinary Chinese citizens, they know their system's not not working perfectly. But uh, when they see what's happening in the United States and other places, uh, you know, I think for, 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 from their point of view, um, they'd rather be living in China right now than um, in those other places. What's the um, the risk for China from this? Because uh, and we're going to save it for the end of the podcast. We are, but we are going to speak about the uh, the emerging trade war and China's some of China's punitive responses to international investigations and economic coercion. But uh, one of the important things here is when you shut down a whole province like uh, um, Wuhan, uh, you realize that you shut down a huge percent, uh, not huge percentage, but a significant percentage of the world's supply chain, and you begin to disrupt things uh, dramatically. So how much of a risk is this for countries like China and countries like uh, Japan and who need the flow and effects from these things? So is there a risk um, um, that these uh, supply chains will shift to places like Bangladesh faster than they ordinarily might have? And how disruptive might this be for the region and countries like Japan? So supply chains, I think there's a lot of different tiers of supply chains. And we think about, for example, textiles, um, you know, it's a relatively low value product. And we've already seen those supply chains shift to um, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And when you travel to Vietnam or Philippines or, or Indonesia or Nepal or Sri Lanka and other parts of India, you've already seen that there's a lot of made in those countries products. And they used to be made in China. Um, China's competitive advantage, of course, is it's, you know, it is this global center of, of, of manufacturing of many sophisticated items. Uh, Wuhan and, 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 and uh, Hebei province were the center of car manufacturing, the center of many pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, high tech firms. Uh, so all of these firms have been impacted very severely. Uh, over the past four months of, of lockdown and, and businesses that were doing uh, business with that part of China, well, they had to find other providers uh, for their products. And what we've seen is that in some cases, uh, those, they couldn't find alternative suppliers, which meant that there is a, a critical um, uh, production network there, as well as logistic network that can't be easily replaced. Other aspects, they could go to Taiwan or they could go to Southeast Asia and other parts of the world that could provide some uh, relief for the, for, for the supply chains that were disrupted in China. But I think the kind of the, the key take home for the Chinese is that um, countries are now aware how over reliant they are on the Chinese production network. And um, the coronavirus has been so disruptive in terms of uh, supply chains and, and getting important goods as, as simple as masks or pharmaceuticals into uh, the global uh, consumer, consumer market. So the risk for China is that countries are going to start to diverse their trade and economic and manufacturing portfolio so that they have less, um, less connections with China. That doesn't mean complete decoupling. What I, think, what I, what I would articulate it, it as is social distancing from the Chinese market or a selective decoupling. And, and these overlap significantly. The selective decoupling um, refers to the fact that there's some things that you can um, decouple from China with or decrease, deleverage from. And there's other parts of the Chinese uh, production network that you just can't because of its sophistication, its labor supply, um, you know, the huge amount of infrastructure that's there. The social distancing aspect that I was mentioning um, is, I think, you know, in some ways, just like we're being social distanced in the coronavirus, is we're trying to create a buffer zone so that we're not so um, at risk to what happens within the Chinese market. And I think what we're going to see going forward is many countries are going to um, shape and probably change their economic portfolio so they're less dependent on China and they'll have a, a much more diverse uh, set of countries that they produce things in that they um, buy and sell things in and that they depend on for, uh, for goods or for um, important things like pharmaceuticals and others. So as we speak about uh, the potential for over-dependency on China, um, as part of that risk for some people has got to do with the, the way China behave and treat their, their, their economic leverage once they get it, for example. 
And let's move into Huawei, which is this really interesting case that a lot of people were paying a lot of attention to before coronavirus crashed into everyone's minds. So let's touch on that because this opens up the space, space really interestingly. This is a, a company that before we get into the issues with uh, with Canada, which is really quite interesting, I might get to start with uh, the 5G network and this idea that, of course, the world need, is trying to build 5G infrastructure. But the, the world also seems completely split around this it's it, while we seem to be at least from my understanding uh the cheapest option out there which is why they're so attractive they can build it much cheaper than other countries can but countries like um australia for example and united states have simply rejected china's offers as a national security risk whereas countries like uh, germany and the uk who you think would be aligned on this have uh, felt that they can mitigate this somehow so what kind of risk comes from letting Huawei build your 5G, for example? And, uh, yeah, I, I want you to op op open that space up of this link between China and its own economic partners in this way. So we, we do we try to understand the position of Huawei within the Chinese economy. I think we need to go back to the Jiang Zemin period of, of China, which, you know, he put forward this idea of the four represents so that the Communist Party would be represented not just by um, you know ordinary citizens and the party members, but uh, they would inculcate uh, business leaders within the party so that they could also help achieve the socialist objectives of, of the, the Communist Party of China. And this happened in the in the mid '90s. In this so-called three represents under Jiang Zemin. And what we've seen since that period of time is that um, you know businesses have become an important economic engine uh, for the Chinese economy. And they work very closely with the party to achieve some of the uh, the social economic strategic objectives. And one of those uh, businesses, of course, is Huawei. Now, Huawei is this, uh, a very high tech uh, business. It works on telecommunications and, um, as you mentioned, the 5G um, system. And the 5G system, to put it very quickly, uh, very briefly, um, basically, it's our phones will be almost instantly connected with all our electronic appliances all around us. And um, it'll enable us to, uh, you know, speed up our our our, our digital lifestyle and, and be much more productive. So the concern that I think many countries have with vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Huawei is what is the relationship with Huawei and the Chinese government? And as I mentioned, um, with the three represent, the business community is now part of the Communist Party, which suggests that there's not going to be much separation between the Communist Party and um, you know, businesses and what they do. Um, now, this is the concern, uh, I think, for Western countries is that then can the technology of 5G that's being espoused by Huawei uh, be uh, employed by the Communist Party nefariously in various countries? Um, so this is a what if question. And um, at this stage, I think the evidence is, is yes, it probably could be deployed. Uh, the, the next question is, will it be deployed? Well, we don't know. Now, you might be saying then, um, you know, but isn't there rules for, for um, you know, separation of, of the government and businesses? Well, yes, but what we've seen in the Chinese context is a track record of when prominent business leaders cross the red lines of the Communist Party, um, they're either removed from the party or uh, removed from the business or um, they're found guilty of corruption in other areas. So this goes back to one of the core points that you mentioned when we were talking about the coronavirus and the decision-making process, is that there's a politicization of uh, decision-making, but also a potential politicization of, of businesses. And I think the concern of the United States, uh, Australia, Canada, and now European countries um, is that uh, the potential for the Communist Party to use these technologies um, in these countries to really, you know, hack people's private information and perhaps uh, something worse. And beyond that, there is another kind of coercion that China step into. So let's move to the issue with um, Canada. And I believe this happened yeah. last year with the uh, the arrest and potential extradition of uh, Huawei executive. I believe she's the daughter of the chairman as well. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on That's that, right. of course. That's right. Okay. And um, so a lot of people would be aware that she was arrested in Canada for potential deportation to America. But what people didn't pay attention to was the protests on the streets around Canada, the um, pro-Chinese uh, uh, 
protests against the, the uh, Canadian government. But you analyzed these, you had a look at these, and you said there's really interesting thoughts on this, this idea, you, you, you said that uh, you had those similar phrasing across the banners and similar uh, um, notes in all the organizing, which suggested it was linked and, and run from China itself, or at least from the embassies, not, it wasn't an, an organic process. So, and this is an interesting thought here, that China uh, are moving into spaces around the world where, yeah, maybe they're not going to be able to economically pressure you, but they're going to use every mechanism they can to try and sum up um, social pressure in a way on the streets. So uh, I didn't open up the the issue of her arrest that well, so I might get you to touch on that first. But also that in, that that issue that China are happy to perhaps foment uh, protests, even if they're just peaceful in other people's countries. Well, what we've seen, I think, um, it's a it's a long-standing practice, uh, primarily um, to, uh, implemented by uh, a department within the Chinese government called the United Front, and it, its primary purpose is to try uh, originally to shape the views and behavior of of um, ethnic Chinese living in other countries, so they could be ethnic Chinese Canadians or ethnic Chinese Australians or ethnic Chinese New Zealanders, um, but they've been trying to co-opt these these um, Individuals so that they behave more favorably to the to the the you know the strategic objectives of the Chinese state in particular the party. So what we saw in the Canadian context, but it's just not the Canadian context. And I would like to be clear here: um, Australia experienced this, New Zealand experienced this, many countries experienced this. That in the wake of uh, Miss Wang's uh, Meng Wanzhou's arrest, what we saw is organized events that had too much similarity. Uh, to not have been coordinated through local consulates and the local embassies in, in various countries. Um, again, using the similar slogans, using what we call government speak, uh, and using um, very selective and, and interesting ex expressions to leverage the, uh, you know, the legal systems over, uh, abroad and the values of abroad to try and support the state's interests. And I'll give you an example. So, um, in the Canadian context, there was a lot of alluding to the human rights of Ms. Meng Wanzhou, which I find really, really interesting because, uh, you know, human rights are actually not, um, you know, central to how the Chinese government manages its own people. But, you know, they deployed these expressions to create kind of a bridge so they could, um, so um, uh, other Canadians could, you know, have some kind of empathy with the demands that the protesters had. But at the same time, they were putting in, they were racializing some of the context in terms of the arrest of a, of a Chinese, you know, executive, uh, an arrest of a, a, you know, an illegal Chinese resident, and trying to racialize this in some ways as well. So, you know, the way the United Fronts works abroad is is really uh, sophisticated, um, and it, you know, it uses both, um, you know. Uh, 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 memes from the the local uh, state that they're in, but also they try to uh, emphasize a lot of the, um, I think, the long-standing themes that China uses, such as the century of humiliation and, and you know trying to keep Chinese down, as part of their efforts to shape the the narrative about China in foreign countries. Um, so. Let's touch a little bit on Hong Kong and, uh, of course, the recent news in just the last couple of days have come out. I'm not sure about the fundamentals of those details, but they seem to be a much firmer step forward and a much larger risk to human rights inside Hong Kong. And this comes back to a, po a point that comes through a lot of your articles and you write, and I quote here, uh, that decision-making process is frozen in some ways in China, which, which is why you get not just coronavirus starting the way it did, but also the lack of information or poor quality information that came to the central government over the 2019 Hong Kong elections and the protests, as in they were in some ways blindsided by this lack of transparency and this lack of information and the lack of, um, uh, I suppose, good good decision making at, at those high levels and the way that information should travel back and forth. So um, let's, let's touch on Hong Kong there because it, it, it it is a small microcosm that offers a lot of important thoughts for how much larger infrastructure projects like the Belt and Road Initiative could work if there is such poor lines of communication and, the, and a frozen decision-making process. So Hong Kong is a barometer for many aspects of, I think, China's relationship with the world. Uh, first and foremost, um, 
you know, what we saw last year, uh, beginning in May 2019, uh, we had protests re relating to an extradition treaty. And uh, we saw um, Hong Kong citizens, up to 2 million citizens at a time, uh, come onto the streets and uh, really ask the uh, local governor, uh, Carrie Lam, to um, take back this law. And these protests considered, continued for months. And um, Carrie Lam eventually withdrew the, uh, the request for this extradition treaty, but it created uh, so many challenges within society. Um, in November of 2019, we then had what's called a, a district council election. And overwhelmingly, uh, the uh, pro-Beijing uh, uh, candidates, they lost their positions. I think uh, the turnout was something like 80 or 80% 80 of eligible voters. And um, the people that were voted in were all, you know, uh, seen as, you know, pro-Hong Kong uh, candidates. And I think that this was a big uh, shock for the for the central government in that um, you know the local Communist Party representatives were seen as trying to they were they were portraying to the central government that you know everything was fine and that the pro Beijing candidates would be reelected. But what we saw this didn't happen, and, and it, it does reemphasize the point that you mentioned and I've been writing about is that the decision making process is challenged by the fact that um, you know. Uh, People within the bureaucracy are afraid to provide, you know, that raw information, the information and the decisions and the analysis that the central government may not want to hear. And this is going to be a challenge, as you mentioned, the BRI is something fiscally sustainable, is something environmentally sustainable. Does this country really want the BRI uh, infrastructure? So this leaves us open to so many questions when, um, you know, the people that are supposed to be pro providing quality uh, analysis to the central government are afraid to not provide that information because of, of, of the decision-making uh, process. And I assume that has a, uh, underlying a lot of that is this idea that um, <clears throat> China don't operate by what you might call a rules-based engagement or a rules-based order, at least not, not one that is easily shared and easily understandable in some ways. And one of the interesting things that you touch on here, we're talking about uh, crises that we couldn't see coming, but you're right here that uh, it was um, a rules-based understanding that kept the United States and the Soviet Union facing off, uh, but also uh, peaceful throughout the Cold War. And this is an interesting thought here, you're right, when you can't um, rely on the other side's behavior and you can't rely on the norms and rules that they're going to follow, then the potential for accidental conflict of some kind is dramatically increased. Yeah, that's correct. So I think when we think about China, um, we're very clear that it it it, it, under, it, it culturally, I think China um, understands that rules are something used to rule people, not necessarily to rule the government. Where I think the Western tradition. Um, uh, a legal code, rule of law, was meant not just to rule um, ordinary citizens, but to rule the, the rulers. And that's how it was formed uh, in Western traditions. And in many ways, these are in conflict, right? So um, the Soviet Union and the United States understood that a rules-based order would um, set firm boundaries of how they engage in their conflict and how they pressure each other. Where I think in the Chinese and, and um, non-Chinese context, what we're seeing is that this rule by law is in many ways uh, in friction with rule, um, uh, rule of law based societies. And what this means is that it's very difficult to set those boundaries of competition, those bound, those no goals in terms of uh, where do we go in terms of conflict. And in this particular way, I think that what we see is that um, I, I'm gonna use the United States and China in particular, that they're going to need to chart out a new framework of what are the boundaries of their, their, their competition. Um, but I think importantly that uh, as a middle power, I come from Canada and, and I think it's really important for us to, to have agency in this process that we shouldn't let these two states just chart out the future of conflict or the future of competition that middle powers need to be proactive in and pressuring both of these states to ensure that, you know, we're not just bystanders in this, in this process of charting out and creating a new rules-based order. And this is gonna be difficult for smaller countries unless we work together. Um, and I think apply pressure 
uh, to both uh, United States and China. And I say both United States and China because at this particular stage in history, I think middle power relationships are very much challenged with the, the, the administration in Washington today. And middle powers are challenged with the relationship in, in with China because in many cases that relationship is 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 used to um, you know as a uh, to put pressure on, on on the United States by um, you know bullying or engaging in economic coercion with with middle, smaller middle powers. Um, so before we get into a really interesting question about Chinese coercion against countries like Australia recently, there is a a moment in this that everyone's a lot of people seem to be overlooking. That is. China are suffering economically as well from this crisis, and you put a number of stats through 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 one of your articles to help uh, show this. So exports uh, plunged uh, seventeen percent in a single month. Imports fell four percent. Ninety five percent of companies saw a drop in revenue. Eighty percent saw operational costs going up. And the stats keep running and running and running on this, and it shows a, a, an, an economic crisis, or at least in China, that people often simply apply to other countries, and China is. The the one pulling the strings and holding the the kettle, so to speak. But um, this is an interesting thought because you wrote a couple of times here, and this is one of those uh, those things that people have in their mind about China that the citizens inside China are happy to accept a degree of um, a lack of democracy or a lack of freedom in their lives as long as economic e economic prosperity keeps keeps improving year upon year, and they can notice that growth. So may so I'm I want you to go to that idea that there may be a risk here. Yeah, sure. In in a democratic country, for for example, there's a risk that the leader may lose the next election. But there's a risk in China that the whole system is under threat from such an economic crisis. So I think we should be really clear that um, you know China over the long term, over the past ten years, has been on a downward trajectory in terms of its economic growth because of demographic factors, because of increased labor costs. Uh, there's declining uh, attractiveness of the Chinese market in terms of a place to do manufacturing, to do business um, because of regulation. And it's becoming um, a, a much darker place in terms of its authoritarian uh, tendencies. So these are kind of those macro level uh, issues that the Chinese government needs to deal with. Right. And they kind of I think they have factored it in uh, those macro levels in terms of how they're trying to have a soft um, soft landing in terms of some kind of decrease in growth. But the coronavirus um, outbreak is, you know, it's a black swan. It's a huge shock to the Chinese system in that all of a sudden that the supply chains had to stop uh, for temporarily. But the supply chains have, um, depend on something what I call demand shock is that the United States, the European countries, uh, Canada, Australia, and other, um, you know, uh, wealthy middle-class societies, well, they're not consuming. And if they're not consuming, that means the Chinese are not, not selling. And if they're not selling, that means that the capital is not coming back into China and it's not um, you know, keeping those Chinese people uh, you know, employed. And, and this is the real challenge for the Chinese government. They have to deal with the macro issues and then this shock. Um, and, and I don't know how they're going to manage this going forward because as you mentioned in the in the stats that I, I put in in this Pacific uh, Forum article, um, it doesn't look good. Unemployment is way up. Business uh, and bank uh, business bankruptcies are going up. Um, what we're going to see going forward is a, a selective um, decoupling of, of economies. So how does the state continue to generate economic growth when um, you know? The, the markets that it depends on for consumption of the products aren't there. And, and this is a question that would challenge uh, a democratic state. It challenges the communist state. And I think that it's going to continue to challenge uh, China going forward. Will it be the crucible that breaks the communist party's back? Um, I don't have a crystal ball to, to tell you that, but I think that it's going to definitely stress how the Chinese com uh, communist government moves forward. But you do have a very, in that same article, a very uh, ominous end to the article where you write, um, uh, if this economic um, re uh, pain begins to bear out and China uh, see a risk internally from social cohesion, they, they may seek, and I quote here, um, assertive nationalistic enterprises to fill in this gap and to re redefine their own purpose and their own legitimacy as as. To, to remain in leadership in the country. And uh, countries like Taiwan and issues like this would suddenly become under risk 
So how how real do you think that kind of prospect could be? A Chinese government uh, losing its power and its grip and its and its original purpose and its original initiative here, original wrong word, but uh, its current initiative and its current reason for being there uh, wouldn't just casually walk away and say, okay, it's over, we can't do this. They may start reaching out for more um, kinetic ways, that's a terrible word though, but uh, of trying to uh, fix this problem or trying to reestablish themselves in power. And countries like Taiwan and issues like South China Sea may suddenly be dragged into this in uh, horrible ways. Well, I think in terms of ranking risks within the region, Taiwan is probably the highest, then South China Sea, and then perhaps... uh, North Korea and, and, and uh, some kind of risk between Japan and China over the Senkaku Dayuta Islands. I say Taiwan risk is, is probably the highest because, um, you know, the Communist Party has stated its legitimacy on reunifying China. And reunification of China means bringing in Taiwan into, um, into and under control of, of the Communist Party in, in China. And this remains a longstanding Uh, goal. It has not uh, changed over the past um, 70 years. I don't think it's going to change. Uh, It's become even more important in the wake of the protests in Hong Kong in 2019, which has fundamentally delegitimated the one country, two systems model. Uh, Just this week with the the national security law being proposed by uh, by the Chinese government, this has further delegitimated the one country, uh, two systems model, and I think emboldened the Taiwanese to take a, a more proactive uh, road towards some form of permanent um, status quo between China and the, and, and and Taiwan. Um, and Taiwan is gaining global support for its its diplomacy, global support for its uh, liberal democratic system, and of course global praise for how it dealt with the coronavirus nineteen. These are all very inconvenient truths and realities for um, Zhongnanghai, the government in Beijing. And it's going to have to find ways to deal with um, with Taiwan. Uh, and this is a, a serious concern as, as the Chinese economy does decelerate. How does uh, Beijing you know, create a cohesive to bring people together and my my fear is is that it could be a much much harder line against Taiwan, in particular as Taiwan is is garnering uh, global support for um, its behavior, for its institutions, and, and, and for its uh, for its diplomacy. And to turn the magnifying glass on China here, you've, uh, some of your recent articles have been uh, r- just gripping reads in the sense that I'll give you the title of one, an independent COVID investigation is an imperative. So as let's, let's, let's jump into that really interesting space here, this idea of an investigation into China and how they behaved. And it didn't occur to me until reading your articles here. So uh, there's such an interesting um, parallel to this. And that might be the best place to start this off. And that is how Japan behaved after the Fukushima disaster and how uh, countries shouldn't uh, and don't always see this idea of people calling for an independent investigation or international bodies coming into their country. It doesn't have to be seen as this grand invasion of sovereignty. In fact, countries like Japan behaved incredibly differently and they also spend an awful lot of time um, being self-critical, asking important questions about nuclear power and not not suppressing their own civil society when protests would form or, or people would uh, um, voice their concerns across social media. So um, for a lot of people listening, let's take everyone into that moment in Japan and uh, and the aftermath of the Fukushima disaster as a counterpoint to how perhaps China are behaving now. Well, I think we, you know, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear incident was caused by um, I think the the international investigation by the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as national investigations, found huge responsibility for uh, the nuclear accident um, to be squarely laid in the regulatory challenges uh, in Japan in terms of poor decision making, uh, in terms of collusion between the state and TEPCO, which was the uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, organization that, that uh, ran the nuclear power plant. Um, and, and these conclusions, um, these very open conclusions for global consumption, domestic consumption, 
really laid blame for uh, the crisis um, in the government and, and in its practices. And what we saw is that the government tried to uh, change the regulations, created more transparency, create more accountability. Um, and this was done, I think, in part because of these independent or, uh, investigations um, from the AI, uh, International Atomic Agency, uh, Agency. But also we had a very active civil society and scholars that, you know, they were out there, you know, they were in the Fukushima area, they were studying the impact of, of, of radiation and the impact of, uh, on, on people's lives and the economy. And they, they looked into, you know, the collusion between the state and this, this uh, TEPCO. And uh, I mean, the level of interaction and, and how people were making the state accountable was incredibly, um, uh, you know, I, I think admirable and, and inspiring. And, you know, today many of the academics, I think a lot of them at Sophia, Tokyo University and others here uh, have done a tremendous service to Japan in terms of improving the government. And the reason why I chose that to contrast um, uh, the demands for an independent investigation in terms of the outbreak, initial outbreak of the virus in, in Wuhan was to try and, and de-racialize this, de chinify this, and talk about how other countries have tried to manage uh, their ineptness, and their problems with a disaster uh, in, in a relatively transparent way. And I think that the Japanese model is, is not a bad model. It's not perfect. And the outcome of that has not been perfect. But I think that we've seen incredible improvement um, in Japan and how it manages crisis. Um, and, you know, I, I was criticized quite uh, severely by many um, Chinese that this was some kind of racialized article, but I, I don't think so. And that's why I took, ch chose Japan because, you know, I think uh, Japan's also an Asian society and it wasn't about race. It was about um, improving the systems to better deal with um, challenges uh, to governing uh, in the wake of a disaster. So let's build up this picture of this investigation. So I might get to start with exactly what Australia are calling for and uh, why Australia are doing so. It's something I kind of figure out is I was quite shocked as an Australian to see it happen and I didn't expect it from um, uh, such a, a, a relatively small country, but it's a, it is a middle power. And it was a call to investigate Australia's largest trading partner, which is such deep eco economic ties for. So um, it opens up a couple of really interesting questions there. One about uh, why a country like Australia would see this as so important, because Australia doesn't have the sort of emotional politics that you do have in America, for example. But also yeah. the question of um, middle power strength in a way. This is not something people expected a country like Australia to ever do. So what is the purpose of the inquiry and why would a country like Australia make such a stand? Well, I think rightfully so. Australia has demanded an inter independent inter international investigation to look at in the origins of the outbreak. And I think uh, this is different than origins of the virus. And I do think that some of the media has, has conflated these two issues, the origins of the outbreak. And, and I think that it has something to do with the systemic challenges within China. This has nothing to do with being Chinese. Um, you know, the virus obviously impacts you know, human beings, uh, and we've seen that globally. So um, this isn't about investigating uh, the Chinese. It's about investigating the systems that led to a global outbreak and trying to improve uh, that system. I think without uh, a better understanding of that process, that we're not going to be able to improve global governance and to improve the, our response to another uh, pandemic going forward. And I think that is really what China, uh, Australia's purpose is, is to try and prevent the next global pandemic, uh, to prevent the economic uh, tsunami that we're all experiencing right now, as well as you know, the, the health and uh, crisis that we're experiencing. Why did Australia do it? Um, I think that Australia's uh, biggest trading partner is China. Um, I think that you know it has a long-standing and positive relationship with China until recently, and that I think that um, you know it's I, my my view is it's meant to uh, try and help uh, China move its governance structure and those systems to a more positive direction. Um, but that said, we're looking at what's being read, uh, being written about uh, the motivations for Australia uh, domestically in China. And I think friends of China, they see this as highly politicized. Uh, and I think that is 
you know, unfortunately not uh, the right conclusion to the analysis, but, um, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a space for these kinds of voices as well. And um, China's response. So this is uh, interesting. We touched on this a little bit beforehand. Uh, let's go to the immediate economic response of China. So it was first criticism and uh, accusations of racism and discrimination, which you mentioned there as well, which, of course, uh, don't make a lot of sense when you look into it. But um, the response was economic coercion. And so Australia has uh, uh, imports to China, exports of um, uh, beef, I believe, and barley exports, which may not sound like a lot, but for Australia, that is a significant industry inside Australia. These were shut down. And um, so I might get to, to go there. So what was China's response? How reasonable was it? And they seem to have a history of this. They've done, they did similar things with, uh, with uh, Canada after the Huawei incident. They did similar things with uh, South Korea after THAAD. So uh, China seems to have a history of using economic coercion to try and bully middle powers in this way. Well, I think that first and foremost, we need to look at the special economic relationship between Australia and China, which makes Australia, I think, um, one of three or four countries that are uniquely susceptible to this kind of pressure. Uh, Australia's biggest trading partner, and I think much of the past 30 years of prosperity in Australia have been related to its uh, very deep economic relationship with China. So uh, what we first saw is the Australia, the Chinese ambassador to Australia uh, threaten uh, Australia by, um, after the initial calls for the um, investigation by uh, speaking about not buying Australian wine or not buying Australian beef or not sending Chinese students to Australian universities. Um, and this was seen as a threat. And uh, as Australia continued to push forward really courageously to push for an international investigation, the Chinese initially uh, decided to stop buying uh, beef from four um, arbiters in Australia. And then just this week, they decided to slap um, tariffs on Australian barley, which means Australia won't be able to sell one of the most important products that they sell to China. This will have severe impacts on the Australian economy. Um, going forward, we don't know what the next tactics is going to be by the Chinese. Will they stop students from coming um, to Chinese uni uh, Australian universities? Will they stop Chinese tourists from coming to Australia? And um, these are very, very serious questions um, for the Australian government because um, so much of their economic prosperity is linked to their relationship with China. Now, you correctly mentioned that China's done this with the Canadians, with the South Koreans, with the Japanese, with the Filipinos, with the Norwegians. So it's a track record to, of using their um, economic uh, relations with um, other countries to try and coerce them into uh, shifting their position on important issues that the Chinese government um, is trying to push. Uh, this is incredibly troubling, but I think it's an opportunity for um, the targets of these economic co coercion to think creatively how they can uh, reshuffle their economic portfolio with China, work with other middle powers, and trying to uh, sh transform international institutions such as the World Tra Trade Organization to close some of the loopholes that China uses to apply pressure on countries to shift their political stance that um, is, uh, is, from the Chinese point of view, against the Chinese. So how much of an opportunity do you think this is for middle power growth and middle power alliances around the world? As you mentioned before, there's perhaps been too much um, domination from countries like America and China, but both have their own political crises at the moment and both are not offering the same kind of influence and uh, magnanimous sort of behavior you'd want around the world. So I wonder how much opportunity you see out there for middle power alliance and the kind of power that they could wheel around the world. For example, Australia are losing their exports, but you could have countries like India and China and uh, sorry, and Japan and South Korea stepping in to fill in that as much as possible. And also stepping in to influence countries like America and China as a single block. So uh, how much of an opportunity do you, do you see this as being for middle powers around the world? Well, I think it's imperative, uh, first of all, that middle powers start to work together uh, more cohesively to try and um, ensure that the direction of the evolution of our international system is not just shaped by the United States and China. Um, under the particular leaderships in both capitals, what we're seeing is unilateralism in the United States, 
you know, not working with traditional partners, um, really stepping away from traditional platforms of American diplomacy. And in China, of course, I think that uh, there's no question that it's trying to dominate um, East Asia, uh, you know, becoming the regional hegemon here and to tweak international systems so they're more friendly for authoritarian governments. Um, middle powers need to work together to ensure that um, the United States comes back to a more multilateral um, position not just in trade, but in many different areas. And um, middle powers also need to work with China to try and ensure that um, it understands that, uh, that it, it needs to be part of the community of nations and it needs to work within a rule -based structure, rules-based structure. So the question is, is where do middle powers target their, um, their cooperation? And I think there's three levels. And, um, you know, uh, there's a, a really interesting paper out of the McDonald Institu uh, Laurier Institute in Canada uh, by uh, Dr. Chen, uh, Dr. Chen, and he writes, you know, about this idea how we need to improve the WTO and and try to fix the loopholes that exist within the WTO that China exploits to apply pressure on um, friends of the United States, in particular middle powers such as Australia, Canada, etc. Um, the second area he talks about is how, um, you know, China uh, really tries to find and use the, uh, the, put a maximum pressure in a very focused way on targets of economic coercion. And the third area that I think um, he identifies is that uh, China's pattern of really trying to peel away alliance partners and friends of the United States through uh, punitive pressure. So if we're thinking about middle powers and how middle powers can work together, we have to think at these three levels. So in terms of the WTO and reform, it's essential that they have a collective approach in terms of uh, trying to ensure that those loopholes are closed uh, and, and, and find consensus. But in that process of consensus, if we don't have the United States on board, it's going to be impossible to you know, pursue any kind of reform. Now, if that doesn't work, then I think the next step is a scrap and build process or use pre-existing trade agreements such as the CPTTP or perhaps even the Japan-EU um, EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, um, to try and tweak these, these um, trade agreements so that uh, they're more protective uh, of the trading members. You know, and I use an expression called the musketeer clause in, in my recent um, article, the one for all and all for, uh, all, uh, all for one and one for all, is that I think that uh, if we somehow include a clause in trade agreements in which um, the participating members agree to um, share economic, diplomatic and other forms of, of pressure on a, a, a country that's targeting uh, countries with economic coercion, we might be able to push back against some of the pressure um, that we're experiencing. So let's give an example. Right now, Australia's beef and barley industry is being hit extremely hard by China. So uh, one possibility is that the markets of Japan, maybe India and others, suck up some of that, um, those commodities so that the pressure is not so hard on, on, on Australia. But they also collectively um, put pressure on China to try and shift their position. In terms of that maximum pressure, I think that, uh, you know, uh, 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 mus musketeer clause might help, but really these middle powers need to work together to try and ensure that um, when one of their countries are being targeted that they find collective ways to put pressure on the, the country that's targeting them. And we should be clear, this isn't just China, right? The United States uh, lobbied uh, steel, steel tariffs on Japan and many other countries over the past two years. Uh, perhaps they could be a target of this pressure as well. Um, last thing I think importantly is, you know, is if China is continue to try and peel us away from our, our, our partners, such as the United States, that we need to double down on that relationship and find other opportunities and build other institutions to strengthen those partnerships. Uh, that's not easy, but um, it's really important to continue to strengthen those partnerships and realize that um, if we continue to let this be, this pattern of behavior of splitism or trying to peel away uh, alliance partners and friends of the United States from the United States, that this is going to happen not just to Australia or South Korea or Japan, but it's going to happen to all of us. And uh, this will have severe consequences in terms of how we uh, exhibit agency in, in the international system, um, how we engage in bilateral relations with China, but also how we engage
in, in our in our relations in general. And I think these are three areas that are really important for us to be uh, focusing on if we want to have more middle, middle power solidarity and middle, middle power agency uh, as, as China and the United States uh, continue to deepen in the rivalry. So that musketeer clause that you mentioned there, I when I was reading through the article, I paused on that. I found that really interesting because a lot of people listening will say, how can China simply stop importing Australian beef and Australian barley when they're a member of the WTO? But of course, they're using specific clauses under the WTO. They're making claims and maybe Australia can challenge these things. But of course, it's going to go to arbitration and take years. Yeah. In the meantime, Australia suffer the economic consequences of this. And this musketeer clause is is really a fascinating thought because I've heard about this kind of thing with um, um, African countries doing this, this, this kind of initiative, or at least talking about it in terms of democratization and, uh, and uh, free marketeers. But I haven't heard it in terms of middle power. So it, it, it's a, it's the kind of thing that when you think in theory, it, it's a wonderful way to ensure that each country um, does support each other because they are legally, but multilaterally bind bound to actually support each other, and each other in such battles. So, how plausible do you see it? I mean, I'm, I, this is a broader question because you spent so many years studying a middle power. Uh, relationships do you have much hope for these things because as i as i read that i paused and i got this little moment of hope myself and thought of oh, that would make a massive difference so do you see this kind of thing as a as a plausible outcome in the next few years well that really depends on a, a few factors i think uh, the united states election in 2020 november and the outcome will either accelerate this process or probably put the process in the grave um I think another factor is the direction of the U.S.-China relations and how this is going to um, impact the middle powers. My assumption is that middle powers will have increasing pressure on them as the relationship between the United States and China becomes uh, uh, more difficult. Um, for China, that's the, the natural place to put pressure. You can put the most pressure on the United States by uh, peeling away alliance partners, and, and that's the United States' major strength within the region. It's you know network of alliances and partners, and if you can start to break that down, then you can start to achieve your long-term strategic initiatives of being the, the regional hegemon. So in terms of optimism, I think that um, middle powers have little choice but to try and move forward and advocate for this. I think what we've seen, and, and you know, I'm based in Japan, and I watch a lot of things from Japan, but travel through the region, I think that um, the Japanese government clearly understands that this is the way to move forward, is to forge a partnership with like-minded countries, um, and those are mostly middle powers, right, um, to try and form a rules-based system within the region, to try and um, forge more economic partnerships within the region. And this is why we see things like the free and open Indo-Pacific Really, uh, you know, their major pillar is an economic pillar, development pillar to try and, and boost development and interconnectivity between the ASEAN countries, the Northeast Asian countries and South Asian countries. So I think that um, Japan may get it, um, whether they like and they're comfortable with the concept of Japan being a middle power. That's a wholly, totally different podcast. But um, <laughs> I think that they do understand that uh, it, it's it's not going to be boats and, and guns and, and missiles that is going to bring stability to the world. It's going to be countries sharing a, a, a common understanding of a rules-based order to constrain, uh, in particular China in this region, because I think that's the biggest concern. Um, but I think a rules-based order that also constrains uh, the unilateralism that we're experiencing under the Trump administration. So I want to find a few questions here. Um, the Australia's investigation that they launched passed the United Nations by a significant number. So it seems the investigation has been put into effect. Um, do you see this as China acknowledging its own vulnerability? Do you think this investigation will happen? I, I really want to pick your brain on this, on, on how you feel about this. Do you think China uh, felt pressured, felt leveraged and felt they had to cave on this? Or is this China perhaps um, just playing the long game and thinking, well, I will, uh, this is, I will just continue to obfuscate and this is a way to buy some time? So I think that um, when I pick the minds of uh, the scholars that I know in China that are, I think, um, well, look at this in non-ideological ways, mm. that 
they think that it's it, it's crucial that there's going to, to be an in investigation. The problem is, is any investigation is going to come up with, uh, and it's going to show that it's a systemic problem that's a, that has led to the initial outbreak of the virus. And the systemic problem has been um, created by the consolidation of power under Xi Jinping. So this points a lot of fingers at, you know, those taboo topics within the Chinese political sphere. Um, Xi Jinping's invulnerability, um, the political system under the CCP, uh, the consolidation of power. Um, any in independent investigation is going to be hugely problematic in terms of re revealing these kinds of systemic challenges. So I don't expect uh, a transparent or investigation to go forward. Um, I expect it to be truncated in some capacity and it will point out most likely that the problems were associated with decisions made at the local level and try to uh, deflect responsibility from what I understand is the systemic problems within the system. Uh, but that being said, I think that the global community will find other ways to uh, find uh, ways to get a better in understanding of you know, what were the conditions and what were the problems with the initial outbreak. And I think this will be presented to the uh, Chinese government no matter what. And it will be used to improve their governing governance systems. But that being said, I think the Chinese will take on their own investigation and they will try to improve their own governing structures. And I think that this ex epidemic um, or global pandemic is in some ways similar to um, the health or the environmental challenges that China has experienced over the past 10, 15 years, is that the environmental challenges and the coronavirus affected and impacted every single Chinese citizen, rich, poor, socially privileged or not, and that it's some, an issue that the Chinese government can't escape. Um, and I think that because of that uh, you know, shared experience of all Chinese is that they're going to put a tremendous amount of effort into trying to improve their governing structure so this doesn't happen again. So as a final question, I can't leave without asking you this, just the, the, amount of, uh, the amount of years and time you've put into studying not just middle power relationships, but East Asia and the Asia Pacific. Um, with this crisis that we now have, I wonder how you see the region itself as a broad stroke. Do you see that this is a, um, a crisis that could perhaps, um, uh, I, I guess it's a question about how hopeful you are as an individual about the changes this may bring to the region as a whole. Because a lot of the things that we've been speaking about today have things that have been theorized a number of times and thought about in certain issues. But the coronavirus does offer a, a crisis which offers an opportunity for dramatic change. And we touched on this a little bit, but I wonder about you personally. How hopeful do you, do you see this as... as uh, potentially spark in something important and important change in the region that perhaps was a, a rumbling along in the background? Or do you see this as um, as the opposite, something that's going to perhaps hinder relationships or growth? So how positive do you personally feel about the future of East Asia and um, uh, the Asia-Pacific and a rules-based international order dominating that particular region? Well, positively, I think that um, because of the internet and because of uh, social media, um, the world has been able to share their experience with coronavirus through humor, through tragedy, through um, very piercing document, uh, online documentaries such as the Wuhan Diaries. So in some ways, it's been able to create a shared human experience that uh, might be a platform for uh, developing a much uh, what's the best way to put this, uh, a better sense of our interconnectedness. Um, but I think more realistically, um, I think that the coronavirus pandemic has unleashed many forces that are going to create um, more challenges that uh, we're going to need to cooperate. Um, let's just think about how it, the coronavirus pandemic has stopped um, migration within the region. Think about all the remittances from Indonesian and Filipino uh, workers that are not going back to their home countries. Think about how uh, the informal economies within the region have been absolutely devastated by uh, the inability to move um, 
because of lockdowns in various countries. These are going to have huge destabilizing effects in Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, and it's going to require a huge amount of investment from uh, rich countries, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, Western countries. Uh, China is going to need to be part of this, but they're going to have a huge amount of challenges domestically as well. I think that the coronavirus has also uh, shed light on a huge, num- a huge amount of industries that can benefit, whether it's health technology, uh, online education, uh, the importance of uh, you know, uh, digital infrastructure so that everybody can benefit from these uh, areas. So I think those will be winners um, but I think that um, we're going to see more social economic inequality develop, and this will probably bring more uh, instability, more extremism to the region that, uh, you know, until you know, six months ago looked like it was moving in a, a little bit more positive direction. And what about changes uh, in your home in Japan? Do you see anything that this is going to change uh, dramatically around you? Do you see the changes happening already? Well, I think J- Japanese people have embraced telework. They've embraced, um, you know, a, a slower pace of life. We've seen, interesting enough, there was a, a, um, a pretty good article in the New York Times uh, maybe last week about men taking on more of a role in the household. So I think that in some ways the corona crisis is, is, is an opportunity for Japan to unleash a lot of uh, inner talent to move beyond that rigid corporate structure that kind of Sing, uh, is a signature of its 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 economic success and economic failures. Um, we've seen the government try to digitize many aspects of the economy. So I think that uh, Japan will probably come out uh, much better from this position than many many other countries because it's r- rich, wealthy, um, and it's managed the crisis I think really really well. But there still will be losers here as well as well. I think. Um, Unfortunately, I think that there'll probably be more racism against some countries with, you know, being suspect as, as the origins of this virus. And I, 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 I would not be surprised this did, won't occur in South Korea as well and other places. But in general, I think Japan's going to move in a better place. Um, it's going to unleash many kinds of opportunities. And, and it's demonstrated that there's many possibilities outside uh, that rigid form of, of corporate life that Japan has really existed in for much of the post-Cold War period, or post-World War II period. And I have to imagine they're planning for a dramatic coming out party for the Olympics, uh, now post- postponed one year. Yes, and I think that it will be uh, a, a celebration of uh, the world's resistance and successful resistance against the corona crisis. I think it will be shift its focus away from uh, a Tokyo-centric and Japan-centric uh, vision to one that will celebrate um, you know, the global community and global cooperation and dealing with coronavirus. But also, I think it's going to really focus on um, Japan transforming itself to be a, a, a more open and and productive society. And, and again, it's going to highlight its, its um, shared international values, shared international character, but also it's some of its unique aspects of, of its long history and, and, and interesting culture. So that's a, a great note to leave our discussion on today. Um, I based uh, most of the research for this podcast on a series of Stephen's articles, which I'm not just going to link below, but I'm going to link the permanent links where you can keep up to date with his uh, journalism. I assure you it's going to it's it's so regular, you're going to be breathless. It's absolutely fantastic and riveting and deep in detail. I read it each week and I do encourage you to as well. And you can catch up on all the articles that we used for the podcast today. So on that, Stephen Nagy, thanks again for coming on the Korean Out podcast. Thank you very much, Jed, and I look forward to your future podcasts. They're really educational. I do share them with all my students and colleagues. Keep well, keep healthy, and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean Out podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening. (laughs) 